I have to grant that. We, I was expecting uh, a Russian military move of one sort or the other uh, uh, on Ukraine, to be honest with you. So uh, normally I should not be, I should not have been that surprised, but I just could not help and feel surprised and shocked and saddened with what I was witnessing. I thought this was not a crisis about or centered uh, in Ukraine, but this was a crisis of European security because what basically Putin had in mind was a revisionist goal of reconfiguring the security situation to, uh, in a way that would favor Russia uh, 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 bilaterally with the United States. And probably he was counting on uh, Biden's uh, old age and his uh, visible, indeed, uh, uh, fatigue, uh, physical fatigue. So probably he thought he had a good window of opportunity, especially when the United States was trying seriously to pivot to Asia. So these, you know, uh, provided the perfect conditions. Putin, as you know, uh, in the prime of his manhood, wanted to test the old man. You know, counting that uh, U.S. would be slow and uh, reluctant to respond, and and the Biden administration, you know, in 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 some respects, fared performed much better than I anticipated. I have to grant that. You know, they never let this uh, turn into a bilateral issue between United States and uh, and Russia, in a fashion, you know, uh, because Putin had in mind probably a 19th century type, you know, great power settlement of uh, uh, the European issues. Uh, US administration, Biden administration, never allowed that happen. They brought uh, the Europeans into default and they did everything to keep them in default, especially despite, uh, despite the German reluctance and unpreparedness uh, to tackle such issues, such issues of strategic significance. You may remember, you know, uh, well remember also, uh, German Navy chief's comments, you know, in a conference in India. And he said, you know, we have, uh, we have to understand Putin and that cost him his job. But we're talking about a top flag officer of German armed forces, you know, kind of uh, expressing views appreciative of what Putin uh, had in mind and what Putin was demanding. So uh, from this uh, mindset, uh, yesterday, we uh, came to uh, a situation where, where or when uh, the German government took the unexpected step of uh, suspending uh, the North Stream 2 deal. So that's an important step. As for Turkey, uh, well, President Erdogan, you know, he counted on his personal relations with Putin a lot from the very beginning and hoped that he could interject himself in the process for a peaceful outcome or for an acceptable outcome uh, in Ukraine. Uh, but uh, what he and probably uh, other decision makers in Ankara missed that Ankara's perspective, you know, was limited to a regional perspective, uh, the Black Sea. You know, the, and very much reminiscent of, of uh, Davutoglu's idea of regional ownership, which was kind of, uh, which was floated after the Russian-Georgian War of 2008, you know, regional ownership. But this regional ownership uh, 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 level uh, was not sufficient for Putin or Russia because Russia uh, was thinking at a higher level on a larger scope. On a larger magnitude, you know, Russia was uh, after reshuffling the European and world orders. Uh, so, if uh, my again uh, my uh, personal conclusion at the time was that if Putin wanted or had wanted a way out of the situation, he could have counted on uh, Erdogan's efforts to mediate. You know, if he if he needed if he had needed a way out of a face saving option, you know, uh, he could have let Erdogan step in. However, uh, this was not in his mind. Uh, and, you know, today is, today, what happened today indeed uh, is an evidence that 
Putin probably never considered uh, backpedaling, stepping back, and he decided to launch uh, a large-scale military operation. The current state of affairs or the current situation, I'm afraid, does not give President Erdogan uh, many options as regards to maintaining uh, uh, his, uh, so to speak, compartmentalized you know, approach to relations with Russia, compartmentalizing Russia while uh, maintaining Turkey's commitments. I think uh, we have reached uh, and probably we have, we have gone beyond the limits of this policy. And, you know, if you are reading NATO states statements, you know, those are those statements are agreed upon by all members, including Turkey. So Turkey has been acting, at least institutionally, acting in step with its NATO members, uh, NATO allies. Uh, and probably Ankara has realized that, you know, the tackling this crisis has gone way beyond what Turkey, beyond Turkey's capabilities. Uh, and also uh, from a geopolitical standpoint, uh, you know, at the end of the day, if Russia, you know, uh, takes over Ukraine, especially the, the remaining uh, Black Sea uh, coastal regions of Ukraine, while Turkey will have to live next, to, next door to a very uh, powerful, and very ambitious neighbor. And that's a geopolitical uh, fact. Turkey doesn't like neighbors uh, militarily stronger than itself. You know, uh, think of history of Turkey's problems with great powers. Uh, you know, when Turkey uh, had Italy, France, and Britain as its neighbors, you know, Turkey didn't felt uneasy about their presence. But once they left the region, we were okay. Uh, United States was a good friend, uh, acceptable ally, until it invaded Iraq and became the militarily the strongest neighbor of Turkey. So United States is no longer in the region. And Russia kind of uh, uh, stands above the rest in terms of Turkey's, uh, 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 Turkey's neighbors. But what is uh, very interesting is that there is a... a you know, Turkish public does not seem to appreciate the magnitude of what is taking place. You know, uh, there is this uh, tendency to uh, kind of uh, downplay the significance of the current uh, escalation and subsequent, uh, of course, Russian invasion. That's number one. Also, uh, the Turkish public opinion is overwhelmingly pro-Russian, including intellectuals, including opinion leaders, um, even, you know, uh, those who offer, pro, you know, uh, say, uh, make uh, moderate comments, grant that, you know, Putin was provoked by the West. So this is the, the climate here in, in Turkey. And so for Tayyip Erdogan, it's not only, you know, aligning its policy or readjusting, recalibrating its, you know, uh, balancing behavior between uh, West and, and Russia, but convincing the public opinion. He has to turn the public, public opinion around. And for, for a political leader uh, uh, in Tayyip Erdogan's caliber, this used to be a relatively easy task, but I'm not so sure at this point. Uh, he may not sound so convinced, convincing, and especially after the end of the uh, after Cold War, anti-Americanism in Turkey has grown. Has, uh, has taken a very strong route in Turkey and it indeed uh, uh, expanded into uh, the well-educated, Western-educated segments of the society. Um, therefore, uh, uh, there is two sides of the story, the diplomatic the, uh, and the public opinion side, sides. But uh, also, uh, uh, Probably Ankara also, I mean, uh, is able to make the calculation that Turkey cannot stand no chance, you know, uh, against Russia on one-to-one -one basis. So it has to find uh, or it has to renew its commitments with allies. Uh, and therefore, uh, probably Turkey will avoid as much as it can direct involvement in the conflict. 
uh, but there is a lot in, in stake. Not only uh, this uh, 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 ability to you know move between uh, the East and West or e uh, West and Russia, but you know Ukraine became a, an important partner for Turkish uh, defense industries. You know those parts, uh, those uh, uh, defense products would no longer be import could no longer be imported or will no longer be imported from Ukraine. So this will diminish Turkey's ability to gain uh, autonomy or autarky in its defense sector. So uh, and therefore they have to Ankara has to recalculate uh, its priorities and it will need uh, its Western allies uh, arms supplies to uh, maintain a, de a deterrence posture against Russia. Uh, so functionally speaking, uh, the odds are not very uh, favorable for Tayyip Erdogan to do uh, business as usual with uh, with Putin while remaining in uh, in, in the transatlantic community. Uh, it's a time for decision, and, and I don't think he will be able to postpone that decision uh, much further uh, than this point. Well, it's Article 19. It says, in time of war, Turkey not being belligerent, warships shall enjoy complete mm -hmm. freedom of transit. Vessels of war belonging to belligerent powers shall not, however, pass through the straits, except in cases arising out of application of Article yeah. 25 of the present convention, etc., etc. And also, yes. Yes. they are allowed, such vessels are allowed to return to their home bases. So Russians, you know, have been playing this game for centuries and they know intricacies of the detail, final detail, finer details of Montreal Convention. And probably they waited until they completed this uh, uh, naval buildup in the Black Sea until their last vessel returned to their home base. So uh, from an operational perspective, a Turkish decision to uh, close the Bosphorus to uh, vessels or warships of belligerents will not have any practical effect on Russia's capability, ability to conduct the a war in Ukraine at this point. And Turkey indeed, I mean, has kind of been priding itself for being a very uh, careful watchdog of the uh, um, uh, Con Montreal Convention. Uh, at one point, probably Turkey will be compelled to comply because, I mean, uh, the Montreal Convention does not allow much of a room for interpretation otherwise. But this will have not, uh, again, I mean, this decision will not change the situation, uh, the operational situation in the theater, I'm afraid. Probably, I mean, Russians, you know, thought well ahead of time about such restrictions. Uh, the, the, the only problem that could, uh, or the only issue uh, as regards to transit of war, warships through the, the Straits uh, that may cause headache uh, for Turkey is um, non-literal you know, uh, requests to send warships uh, uh, to the Black Sea. And this is not on the table, and this will not be on the table for a number of reasons, you know, because of Montreal uh, restrictions. Uh, uh, at the end of the day, uh, everybody is, everybody's interests are at, will be at stake if, you know, uh, the Montreal Convention uh, is violated by non-parties or non-literals. So, but on the other hand, uh, after uh, the Crimean annexation, United States had been uh, preparing for an eventuality where they uh, they could you know take on Russian Russian naval capabilities in the Black Sea from the air by aircraft. They had been practicing with their strategic bombing bombers uh, over the Black Sea. Uh, so therefore, uh, probably their contingency planning doesn't involve uh, you know uh, transit of warships, U.S. warships or NATO warships into the Black Sea, and indeed. The Black Sea is, a, is an internal uh, uh, sea, uh, and therefore uh, it's not the best environment for large surface vessels. Submarines are ideal weapons for uh, such theaters of operations. And uh, among the Black Sea littorals, only Turkey and Russia have 
uh, meaningful submarine capabilities in that particular theater of operations. Russia is regaining its uh, regaining a decisive influence in the post-Soviet uh, parts of the world or regions of Asia and Europe. Uh, and that comes at the expense of other actors, including Turkey. But uh, the main rivalry probably in Central Asia will not be between Turkey and Russia, but it will be between uh, Russia and, and China. And Turkey, uh, especially in the uh, since uh, the you know uh, since Tayyip Erdogan and Putin, you know, uh, uh, set the foundations of this uh, personal uh, person-to-person relation and uh, relations and dialogue. I think you know Turkey was allowed uh, to get a foot in those regions uh, to the extent Russia thought it was uh, to its benefit or to its interest. Uh, depending on the final outcome of the current situation, it all depends on the final outcome of this uh, 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 this invasion. If it takes long, it, it becomes a, a, a conflict that keeps Russia, you know, uh, pinned down uh, for days, months, years, etc. And uh, the West is resolved to make Russia pay a huge price, not only economically. But in terms of uh, you know a kind of irregular warfare, guerrilla warfare, etc., uh, then it will be a different situation. But if you know the, the, the invasion uh, quickly uh, translates into some sort of a political you know status quo acceptable to all sides, I mean uh, the West and Russia, well uh, Turkey can retain. Uh, you know, it's whatever influence it enjoys in those parts of Asia and in the Caucasus. But it's pretty, pretty much, uh, it, all, it pretty much hinges on uh, the extent to, to which Putin is ready to give Turkey uh, the leeway in those areas. I mean, uh, Turkey's ability to uh, uh, gain traction uh, in, uh, in, in the Caucasus and in, in Central Asia you know, uh, has proven uh, very, how should I say, uh, Turkey has not performed very brilliantly in, in that respect. I mean, there is the interest, but the capabilities are not there. And I think uh, uh, the situation uh, changed dramatically uh, to Turkey's disadvantage after what happened in uh, Kazakhstan, you know. Uh, Kazakhstan was, uh, was, a, was a serious, was an important partner for Turkey. Um, now that you know the Kazakhs are, you know, uh, probably back to the Russian sphere of influence, and they may even revert to the Krill alphabet, right? Because you know uh, their adaptation of Latin alphabet was a big gain for Turkey, considered a big gain for Turkey. So uh, this may be symbolic of what is in the works for Turkey in those parts of the world. Well, uh, Turkey's ability to move. Uh, uh, you know, uh, and act uh, to, to follow, to pursue an active diplomacy and economic policy on these uh, regions will be very much uh, uh, at the mercy of Russian uh, uh, intentions. Putin had his war chest full when he decided to make the move, right? Uh, you know, the experts argue that uh, Russia has $60 billion in reserve. So it can sustain uh, this conflict for the foreseeable future, probably one to two years. The Western observers uh, systematically underrated and underappreciated what Russia could militarily achieve. And I seriously, uh, think that they might be wrong in their uh, assessments in that particular case too, you know. Uh, so uh, the, the Russian military machine, they're not as considerate of human rights, uh, you know, civilian casualties, collateral damages. 
their notion of precision, you know, maybe margins away from the Western notions of precision, etc. So uh, they will fight the hard way, the old school, and uh, regardless of the human human cost and uh, the cost to the image of Russia in the world court. But you know that image was tarnished anyway. You know what Russia has to fear for. Uh, the problem and uh, for Russia will begin when it is exposed to uh, hurting sanctions, economic and tra trade sanctions. But imposing Russia sanctions of this magnitude runs the risk of unraveling the whole global financial and trade exchange system. You know, and that system favors the United States and by uh, 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 sanctioning Russia, by you know, excluding it, it from SWIFT, maybe uh, a self-defeating practice. So what is at stake, not is uh, Ukraine or Europe only, but uh, liberal international order indeed, what is at stake. Uh, and Putin as a leader seems to have taken that risk personally. I, I guess he's going to go all the way. He's sitting on a coalition. And because I'm not a Russia expert or a Kremlinologist, you know, I cannot make out the, his partners in crime or partners in power. But to what extent Putin is representing the majority opinion or the consensus of those uh, partners in power is questionable. And some of the experts, whose uh, views and analysis I, uh, uh, I depend on uh, are not so sure uh, the, the whole coalition around uh, the, or the, the power constellation around uh, Putin are happy with his decision to uh, invade Ukraine partially or uh, totally. But we will see uh, that in that in those in the coming days. So if Russia cannot achieve a very swift, decisive military victory, which will translate again very swiftly into a new political, into a political status quo acceptable for Russia, he will probably get away with, with what he did, what he started. But if it you know, goes on and on, it drags on and on, then uh, the problem of sustainability will have uh, uh, political ramification, domestic political ramifications in Russia. As for the end state, uh, uh, last night, you know, uh, the best case scenario for us would be uh, a limited Russian military incursion uh, to complete uh, the Russian military control in the two separatist regions, because the effective military control, the boundaries of the, uh, the area under effective uh, control of the, the break, breakaway, so-called so breakaway forces, and uh, the boundaries of the, the administrative boundaries of these two regions did not overlap. So the best case scenario uh, for, uh, you know, uh, that was the case last night. Best case scenario was that the Russian uh, military would move in to complete uh, the military control in and on these two regions. There seems to be a, pa a pattern in the US uh, and the Russian military action uh, which, uh, and the pattern indicates that the Russia is intent on dividing Ukraine into two parts. And probably uh, at least uh, for this phase of the Russian military operations, and considering that, you know, they are using Belarus as uh, a staging post for uh, incursions into Ukraine. Now, but Belarus is... Uh, is actively involved, is, ho is hosting Russian troops, and uh, the, the Russians are launching uh, assaults, raids from Belarus. So probably they will attempt to cut uh, Ukraine into two halves from a line uh, probably stretching from uh, uh, Belgorod, I think that that's the name of the city, you know, and all the way to Odessa. And with that, uh, this may be a just one phase of the operation. You know, this may correspond to a, uh, what is called in military terminology, a phase line, you know, an operational phase line. Um, after uh, Russia 
Russian military consolidates its control uh, in the eastern part of Ukraine. Uh, this will mean uh, Ukraine, or whatever is left of it, will be denied access to the Black Sea. And it's only, uh, uh, it's only uh, friendly neighbor will be uh, Moldova and Poland, and of course, Czechoslovakia, etc. But the country will be, uh, to a large extent, surrounded by Russia or Russia-friendly uh, countries. Uh, the ethnic makeup of ethnic and religious makeup of Ukraine uh, suggests that uh, uh, rationally, uh, Putin may stop. You know, here may feel content by controlling, by regaining the control of, you know, Russian speaking, orthodox populated, largely orthodox populated parts of Ukraine with uh, controlling the strategic parts, including, you know, uh, the, uh, the only remaining Ukrainian port in the Sea of Azov, um, Marnuli. Uh, uh, this may be uh, the second based or second worst case scenario in the context of what is taking place in, in Ukraine. However, uh, if we take his words very seriously, if we take what he wrote back in 2019, I, I guess, about the historical unity of Belarus, Ukraine, and, and Russia, he may resume the second phase of the operations to, for a complete uh, invasion of Ukraine. And this will, I mean, each of these scenarios, of course, are likely to generate uh, different political out outcomes with varying degrees of uh, uh, negative uh, consequences on uh, the coming world order. It will be a more conflictual, more war prone and uh, more tense international order marked by competition with uh, probably uh, a substantial reversal from globalization. And, and this, uh, this political act on the part of Russia, of course, will is likely to generate uh, consequences of economic globalization, which may not be a good thing for China at the end of the day, because China thrives on globalization, whereas Russia does not as much. Uh, we woke up to a, a, a totally new world today.